Here, Phil, I'm gonna introduce you with the brine shrimp, my puppet. Um, Phil Brown has a background in limnology. He graduated with a BS in watershed sciences from Utah State University, where he had the opportunity to work with disparate ecosystems um, of the Sawtooth Mountains and Great Salt Lake and gained an appreciation for the diversity in aquatic systems. I can't do both, I'm sorry, Phil. I was gonna introduce you all, I can't do both. <laughs> he graduated from Oregon State University with an MS in fishery science, studying the effects of agricultural water withdrawals on river invertebrates before making the jump back to hypersaline. I love that you jumped to hypersaline. <laughs> That's awesome. He has been involved in the Great Salt Lake ecosystem and Artemia population monitoring since 2008. First as a biologist for the Division of Wildlife Resources and currently with the Great Salt Lake Brine Shrimp Cooperative, where he is involved in the long-term monitoring of Artemia population, nutrients, phytoplankton, and the lake's deep brine layer. He has dragged his young twins to the shores of Sawtooth Mountain Lakes and Great Salt Lake, where they remarked that this one's too cold, and this one burns my feet and thereby, thereby seem to be gaining their own appreciation for the diversity of aquatic ecosystems. Um, this presentation, we're going to try to touch on most of the topics that we address in that chapter of the book. And it's gonna to try to cover a lot of ground and um, you know, a minor amount of detail, but more detail of these topics can be found in that book chapter. So as you mentioned, um, I'm from the Great Salt Lake Branch from Cooperative. We are a cooperative of 17 individual companies which harvest the overwintering eggs known as cysts that the brine shrimp leave behind in the lake each fall. And cysts are used in aquaculture worldwide. This is a sustainable fishery regulated by the state of Utah using an adaptive management program. And so I'm an aquatic biologist with the research and development arm of our company. And the status of the brine shrimp population and the health of the lake is crucial to us. And we maintain a year-round monitoring program that samples the lake in multiple locations. And we examine the brine shrimp population structure. We measure variables such as nutrient levels and the abundance and type of algae upon which the brine shrimp feed and the characteristics of the cysts themselves. And we have data going back to the late 90s and have been doing this intensive year-round surveying for the past decade. And on the side topic, we're really grateful that you showed that video of the giant brine shrimp attacking Salt Lake because it's a common misconception that that was a spoof film. It's actually a documentary. And the monster brine shrimp hatches from a single giant cyst. And every year, our brave fishermen go to great lengths to try to capture that giant cyst and get it off the lake before this disaster can happen again. See? Brilliant. It was a close call this year. That one was about ready to hatch. So, you know, we don't want to brag too much about it, but maybe when you get the chance, uh, thank your local brine shrimp fishermen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> brine shrimp is the common name for the genus Artemia, and as we know, they're not true shrimp. They are crustaceans, and they reside on a narrow branch of a phylogenetic tree that contains Daphnia um, and fairy shrimp, which look a lot like Artemia, but tend to live in isolated freshwater pools and ponds. Artemia are small. They only reach about 10 to 12 millimeters in length, depending on the food supply at the time, and they're free swimming within the water column. And they're planktonic, meaning that while they are able to move short distances under their own power, um, they can't overcome currents and must simply go where they're taken. They eat single-celled algae that float about in the water column, known as phytoplankton, by filtering it out of the water as they swim. And they're very good at this. At peak population densities, they can filter the entire volume of the lake in less than a week. Artemia can handle a wide range of salinity, Physiologically, they can tolerate salinities below 1% and above 20%, though they tend to be healthiest at the low end of the salinity spectrum. However, other organisms are able to occupy that low range of the salinity spectrum as well. And this creates a problem for Artemia because they're not good at avoiding predators and they're not good at competing for resources. So as a result, Artemia kind of need to have the place to themselves. Exclusion of predators in this lake doesn't occur until about 9% salinity when the predatory insect Trichocorixa, or corixids as they're commonly called, can no longer tolerate the salinity. And the Artemia also require a phytoplankton population that isn't dominated by um, inedible forms of phytoplankton such as filamentous cyanobacteria and large varieties of diatoms. And that 
um, has been observed to occur at salinities below 11% on the lake. Artemia can also become stressed in extreme salinity. Above about 18%, we've seen declines in the population in our data. So the optimal salinity range for this population is therefore between 11 and about 18%. And as a result, Artemia tend to thrive in Gilbert Bay, um, which maintains this general salinity range most years. Gunnison Bay, north of the railroad causeway, is far too salty for a healthy population in all but the rarest of years. And um, parts of Farmington Bay can maintain a small Artemia population during years when the water level is correct for that. So I should provide a description of what an Artemia cyst is for those who aren't quite familiar, um, since this stage of the life cycle is key for their ability to live in Great Salt Lake. When we say cysts, we're talking about an Artemia embryo. In the gastro uh, stage of development, which means the cells have begun to, to organize into layers that will later differentiate into specific tissue types. At this stage, it's composed of about 3,000 individual cells, and they're protected by a durable, semi-permeable, semi-flexible shell with multiple layers. The outer layer, you can see here, is pigmented, and it shields the embryo from UV damage, and it provides flotation for the cyst. The inner layer, the embryonic cuticle, <clears throat> is dense, it's rich in chitin, and it's impermeable to most substances, though water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen can pass through. Artemia produces cysts in response to unfavorable conditions, such as starvation, cold temperatures, rising salinity, cues that their habitat is entering a phase which can be lethal to the adults. Cysts are produced essentially to endure difficult times. Very quickly upon release into the water, the embryos enter a state of dormancy until conditions become favorable again, in which case the cysts will hatch out as the youngest free swimming phase known as anoplei. When conditions are favorable for the adults, the Artemia adults can bypass cyst production altogether and release, no, release the anoplei directly as live young. I wanted to provide a brief look at the yearly population cycle of Artemia and Great Salt Lake from our long-term data set. And this year in particular is representative of the general patterns that we see repeated year after year in the system. So the red line we see on the graph is the Artemia population size given as the number of adult Artemia measured per liter of lake water. The green line is the phytoplankton population size measured as the density of photosynthetic chlorophyll A pigments in the water. The light shaded gray is the production of live nauplii. The dark shaded gray is the production of cysts by the population. So in January and February, cysts are the only Artemia life stage in the lake because winter is too cold for the adults and they perished back in December. Hatching begins in March and April as the temperatures warm and river inflows tend to freshen the upper water layers of the lake. And the Artemia have an abundant food supply that has grown over the winter. The Artemia grow rapidly, produce more nauplii, and the population peaks sometime in May or June. And so for a brief time, it's really good to be a brine shrimp. However, the conditions turn quickly. The population rapidly exhausts the food supply, consuming it at a rate uh, much more quickly than the phytoplankton can subdivide and reproduce. And so by the beginning of June, there's hardly any phytoplankton left in the lake and the population begins to starve and produce cysts in response. Only about 10 to 20% of the adults survive that starvation period, and the phytoplankton, which are now freed from so much grazing pressure, can begin to grow back. So for the rest of the summer, the dynamic is much more stable. The Artemia are hedging their bets here by producing a mixture of nauplii and cysts, and their population doesn't expand to anywhere near the level seen towards the beginning of the year. And so in September and October, as winter approaches, more resources are diverted into the production of cysts, and the cysts remain in the lake and washed up on the shoreline throughout winter and begin the life cycle again in spring. Now, Artemia are important to both wildlife and people because of the ecosystem services that they can provide. One of these is control of eutrophication, which is the enriched state of a water body that results in high productivity. Uh, Great Salt Lake is at the terminal end of a very large watershed, so it naturally has high nutrient content and receives additional nutrients from human activities in the watershed, and so it's very productive. 
In winter and spring, when the artemia are absent, the phytoplankton uses these nutrients to grow at very high density. However, when the artemia population peaks, they can consume that phytoplankton within a few weeks and convert that algal biomass into artemia biomass. Water clarity goes from as little as eight inches to more than 20 feet. This peak artemia population each year is really brief because they quickly die back from starvation once they've consumed all of the food. And so during this brief peak, up to eight adult shrimp per liter of water have been measured, <clears throat> once by state biologists and once by our own program. When this occurs, there's an incredible amount of artemia biomass in the lake. How much? Well, if you take that eight artemia per liter and multiply it by the number of liters within Gilbert Bay, and then multiply that by the approximate weight of each brine shrimp, you get a mass that's equivalent to that of about 1.4 million people, assuming each of those people weighs 150 pounds. And that's essentially the entire population of the Salt Lake Valley. Now, remember that the Artemia population stabilizes at a more uh, lower sustainable number after that first starvation period. And if you use that lower, more stable number instead, you still derive an estimate of about 210,000 people, which is just Salt Lake City proper at that point. So, um, you know, Eric, you're not the only one who wants to extrapolate to get a big number. <laughs> and we thought this was interesting. And it's probably something to remember if you ever hear anybody say that Great Salt Lake is um, just a dead, lifeless waste. It's not. And um, this concept's a bit more enjoyable to see than to hear. So we have some um, camera footage from a camera lowered to the bottom of the lake that we were trying something out um, for a different research project. And I think it shows the Artemia population um, rather well. So let me start this. This is at the deepest location of the lake that we sample. And it's during a time period where the Artemia population is high, but it's not at its peak density for the year. And so we're lowering this camera down through about six meters of water until it hits the deep brine layer at the bottom of the lake and continues for another meter, meter and a half. There's that salinity distortion entering the deep brine layer, which is anoxic, full of hydrogen sulfide, um, decomposition, And now I'll fast forward to when we go back up through that deep brine layer and return to the surface. There we go, back into the oxygenated water layer of the lake. And something to keep in mind is that you're only seeing shrimp that are a few feet away, what the camera can see. Keep in mind the Gilbert Bay is 35 miles long and about 15 miles wide. So if you extrapolate what you're seeing here across a water body of that size, it becomes apparent that there's a lot of life in that lake. And up to the surface, and there's Brad Martin. Hi, Brad. <laughs> So, as we can see from that, the Artemia population really is a vast nutritional resource for organisms that are capable of tapping into it. No fish or aquatic insects are present at these salinities, but there are several avian species that do feed on Artemia, and the most notable of these is the Eared Grebe, which uses the open waters of Gilbert Bay as a staging location during migration, particularly during fall and winter, um, when there can be uh, up to 4.5 million of them on the lake recorded by avian biologists. They feed exclusively on Artemia and are able to dive deep below the surface to find them. And flotillas of grebes, as you can see in this picture, can literally stretch for miles across Gilbert Bay when they're doing this. Other waterfowl, such as green winged teal and northern shovelers, will dabble at cyst streaks in the water when freshwater wetlands are frozen over. And California gulls will even peck at Artemia accumulations at the surface. And while Artemia are not the primary food source for these birds, they can provide supplemental energy during difficult periods. 
And um, humans are another organism that can benefit from Artemia as a food source. Artemia nopoli are a crucial feed for the critical early stages of a number of aquaculture species, especially several varieties of table shrimp and prawns. Artificial feeds can't substitute for Artemia here. The young prawn larvae require the swimming motion of the Artemia to trigger those predatory feeding instincts. The nopoli are the correct size for those life stages to consume. They're highly digestible and they can be used to deliver nutritional supplements to the larvae as well. So aquaculture is becoming increasingly important across the globe as global demand outpaces wild harvest. And aquaculture is currently on pace to overtake uh, the amount of uh, wild caught seafood on a global scale. So this situation is not likely to change. So Great Salt Lake uh, can be a hostile environment towards any organism that's attempting to live there. Some organisms like migratory waterfowl can escape, but our team may have to dig in and deal with the year round. And they face lethally cold winters, lethally hot summers, particularly on the shoreline where many of the cysts wash up. And no matter the season or the habitat, um, there's always salinity to deal with. And few species in the animal kingdom are adapted to this kind of extreme. So how do Artemia thrive here? They do it through a diverse series of adaptations which mitigate environmental stresses through their physiology and avoid environmental stresses through life history strategies. Free swimming Artemia, which are the nopoli, the juvenile, and the adults, face high salinities, low oxygen levels, and very warm water temperatures. They survive the salinity by actively pumping salt from the bodily fluids to maintain a relatively fresh internal salinity. It takes a lot of energy to pump salt against an osmotic gradient. And so this process is energetically expensive for the animals. And the higher salinity, the more energy it takes to maintain um, their internal salinity. <clears throat> Hypersaline water also holds a lot less oxygen than fresh water. And artemia are capable of quickly increasing their hemoglobin supply and making types of hemoglobin that are more effective at binding oxygen. Artemia's adaptation to winter temperatures is to produce cysts, which enter a dormant state where metabolism and cellular processes are almost entirely halted. They ride out the cold winter until spring when internal controls and environmental conditions prompt them to hatch. This sequence of dormancy is known as diapause and quiescence, and it's a very complicated realm of cellular biology that was um, figured out from about 50 years of detailed research from some very good um, scientists. So cysts have to cope with more than the low winter water temperatures. Um, as they're released into the water, the high salinity pulls water out of them, dehydrates them. Cysts are washed onto the shoreline, and those that are are dehydrated even further by summer heat. And the dehydration itself would kill most animal species regardless of their life stage. But the cysts, particularly those on the shore, also have to contend with freezing air temperatures, extreme summer heat, and constant UV exposure. So first of all, um, the Artemis shell blocks UV light. Second, they have an unusual set of sugars inside the embryo embryonic cells, such as tree halos, that protect the embryo from dehydration damage. Dehydration causes cell membranes to rupture because the water molecules act as a a structural component of those membranes. So when it's removed, it damages them. But in Artemia, as the water leaves, those sugars take their place and hold those membranes intact. And at that point, the dehydration itself becomes protective for those cysts, because if they contained a lot of water, the freezing of that water would lead to ice crystals that would damage the membranes. So being dehydrated works to their advantage. And third, there's a category of organic molecules known as heat shock proteins that protect membranes and other proteins um, within the cell. Proteins perform a lot of critical cellular functions, but they only work properly when they are maintained in that specific three-dimensional folded shape. And so dehydration and heat um, will distort the shape of those proteins and render them useless. They won't function properly anymore. Heat shock proteins act as what they call molecular chaperones, and they protect that protein structure. So when the cysts are rehydrated, everything works properly again. So these extremophile adaptations are why Artemia is so well suited for aquaculture and why they're harvested. Because the cysts are durable and in that dormant state, they can be harvested, cleaned, dehydrated, 
that packaged and shipped across the globe for aquaculture use. They have a very long shelf life and they hatch very easily for aquaculture operators when they need them. Therefore, the lake's productivity essentially has a global impact, bringing energy and nutrients to aquaculture farms across the globe, which then utilize that to bring energy and nutrients to a large number of people as a food source. So the importance of Artemia, given this, um, sustainable management of the resource is critical. And it was um, great to hear Jamie talk about this in the introduction, um, because it is a point of pride for us, for those of us involved on in the lake. And it's required a unique partnership um, between different inter interest groups and organizations. So the harvest industry expanded very rapidly in the 1980s and early 1990s, and that led to concerns of overharvest. And so in the early 90s, the industry worked with the Utah Division of Wildlife to increase the scientific knowledge of the Artemia population on the lake and try to begin a science-driven management approach. And the resulting technical advisory group included scientists from the industry, um, from DWR and from university researchers. The management plan was developed that set that optimum 21 cis per liter uh, to be left in the lake so that there would be a strong um, Artemia population to start again next spring. And one of the um, successes of this is that the management plan is adaptive, meaning that it is reassessed every year as more data is obtained. And as a result of this collaboration, uh, this lake now has a 25 year record of scientific data collection, sustainable harvest, and functional working groups between these different stakeholders. So part of that sustainable management requires increasing our understanding of the Gilbert Bay Aquatic System in sometimes in unexpected ways. Um, for instance, we collect a lot of data in our research and monitoring program. And one example that we've done recently is the use of DNA to describe the phytoplankton population. This is something we began several years ago and we found some very interesting results from it um, that I won't go into in any detail um, for the sake of time, but we found hidden diversity within the phytoplankton community. <clears throat> we found assemblage patterns that correlate with the location on the lake and different lake conditions. And we found previously unknown seasonal patterns in individual taxa. And additionally, tying in with uh, Melody's microbialite work, about two and a half years ago, during a small sampling, we use these DNA methods to detect microbialite chloroplast DNA in the water column and within the Artemia near the microbialite fields. And so that demonstrates that algal cells from the microbialites do enter the water column and are consumed by the Artemia. And for us, this was a useful reminder that as with other lakes, the open water and the benthic systems of Great Salt Lake are, energen are energetically connected. <laughs> And so finally, um, despite this wealth of research, there are a number of issues that Great Salt Lake faces going into the future. As a terminal lake, it's under distinct pressures. There is substantial agriculture and urban areas within its watershed, and that influences the quantity and the quality of water reaching the lake. Great Salt Lake is also exposed to global forces of change with higher temperatures, ultra precipitation forecasted for the future, and some of which is already occurring. These threats are real, but we have reason to believe that they can be mitigated and perhaps some of them even avoided. And there are two main reasons for this. The first is that we already have that cooperative framework already in place, which includes a lot of scientific expertise, motivated stakeholders, and a growing appreciation for the importance of Great Salt Lake. Second, this cooperative approach has already addressed some prior concerns on the lake, including sustainable management of the harvest, um, progress towards water quality standards for the lake, <clears throat> and even a management plan for the recent railroad causeway bridge that was constructed um, on the causeway across the lake, which provides a rare opportunity to try to mitigate salt balances across the lake as um, water supply comes into question. So it's a continual effort by those who care about the lake. And there are a substantial number of people who do as events like this webinar show. So if we're successful, and there are reasons to be optimistic that we will be, Great Salt Lake will continue to be an important functional ecosystem going into the future. So, thank you.